Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maggie Young. I get to serve as the interim dean and director of Ohio State Lima. And I am so, so pleased to thank you and welcome you to tonight's event, which is put on in conjunction with Road State College um, as part of our Eclipse Science Series, a free series of events um, offered to our community. So the Eclipse Science Series is brought to you through the generous support of Charles River Laboratories and includes four speakers discussing different aspects of the total solar eclipse that will occur in just about a month and a half. Tonight, we welcome NASA Senior Aerospace Engineer Craig Williams, who is joining us from his post at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. Mr. Williams has more than 39 years of civilian and military experience in project management and engineering design for space launch vehicles, advanced space propulsion, space power systems, and related aerospace systems analyses. He specializes in advanced space propulsion technology and conceptual design for deep space vehicles. This evening, Mr. Williams will explore the physics and geometry of an eclipse, including the relative motion of the moon, earth, and sun, and the continued importance of eclipses to the scientific community and the importance of this particular eclipse. Let's welcome Mr. Williams to the stage. Well, good evening, and thank you for having me here to share an exciting story about, that we're about to embark on in a few weeks, the total eclipse of the sun that's visible here in Ohio. Uh, first things first, uh, I'd, li I'd like to, uh, yeah, let's do this first. Where are my technical people? Do we have any engineers or scientists in the audience? Okay. Okay, I usually have to say, come on, fess up. The tough questions are going to go to you if I can't think of the answer. Okay. All right. Now, just a, a disclaimer here. Uh, I am not an astronomer. I'm not even a scientist. I'm just a lowly aerospace engineer uh, that works for NASA. So all the uh, material here I have to take from uh, other sources that are given. Uh, but I have taken enough astronomy courses both in college and graduate school to be dangerous, so let's just leave it at that. And let's make sure, I know this is going to be insulting most people's intelligence, but I want to make sure we're all on the same path here. Earth goes around the sun, the moon goes around the earth, right? And the, I don't have a pointer here, but the new moon, when the moon is, the cartoon on the extreme left-hand side, when the moon is between the earth and the sun, it's called a new moon. You usually can't see it. It's very hard to, to see it. If you have a very, very dark night, you can see some of the reflected sunlight off of it, but it's usually almost impossible to see. Well, that's what the, the phase that we're talking about here for an eclipse, the new moon. And this is another way of looking at it where it's on the right-hand side of this, of this image. And by the way, I will get you out of here in an hour, including Q&A, I promise. Now, what are the conditions of enabling a, an eclipse? Now, there's two groups of conditions. The first one almost never gets discussed, but I think it's philosophically the most remarkable of the two groups of, of constraints. And that is that the apparent size of the moon, the important part is the word apparent, with respect to the distance from the, uh, from the earth to our, 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 to the moon to the earth, is about the same size as that of the sun. For those of you who, uh, in trigonometry, high school trigonometry is in your distant rear view mirror, you know, who can remember the definition of a tangent of an angle, right? Opposite over adjacent, right? So if you look at the, at the left hand side here, the moon is about 1,000 miles in radius, 2,000 miles in diameter, and it's about uh, 200, a quarter of a million miles, 238,000 miles from the center of the earth. That angle, the tangent of that angle, is about the same as the tangent of the angle that's made by the diameter of the sun, about 400,000 miles, and about one astronomical unit, or 93 million miles away from us. Is that just a remarkable coincidence, or what? I mean, it just happens that the apparent sizes of both are about the same. And you have to have that in order to have a total eclipse. And then in addition to all of that, of course, the planes have to line up. The ecliptic, which is the plane that the Earth travels around in this, uh, with respect to the sun, is not the same plane that the moon goes around the Earth on. There's about a five-degree offset between the two. 
And because of that, the shadow of the moon frequently goes off in one direction, off to the other, but not hitting the Earth at the right moments at the right place. So what is that? Well, here's a, a better way of looking at it. Now, these are not, some of these pictures that I have, are cartoons that I have, are not to scale. This one is not to scale. It's merely to make it a little bit more easier to understand. If you take a ray of light, uh, okay, I'm going to have to describe this. If you take a ray of light from the bottom of the sun, move it towards the moon so that it is tangent to the upper portion of the moon, um, yes, the upper portion of the moon, that forms a shadow, and that's that larger shadow at the top of that, that oval, okay? And then if you imagine that ray of light emanating from higher and higher, from, from the bottom of that sun higher and higher, all that part of the sun is visible to anything in that larger oval around the Earth. Okay, that's a partial eclipse. In other words, parts of the sun cannot be seen, but other parts can be seen. Similarly, if you take a ray of light from, the, again, the bottom of the sun, but make it tangent to the bottom of the moon, okay, so tangent, you go bottom of the sun to the tangent of the bottom of the moon, and then extend it to the surface of the, of the earth, that forms a much darker, much smaller uh, shadow. That's the area that is in total eclipse. In other words, as you move that ray of light close, uh, further and further up uh, from the sun, from the bottom to the top, the moon obscures all rays of light, so it doesn't see the sun anywhere. That's the, that's the, the, uh, the smaller oval that you see in the, on the right-hand side at the Earth. That's the umbra. And the penumbra is the larger one that at least you have a portion of the, of the sun is obscured by the moon. So that's why you see much, more, much greater uh, regions that can have a partial eclipse but not a total eclipse. And again, this is not drawn to scale, but this is what's, what goes on in, in a total eclipse. Now, if you ask, what does this look like from outer space, you'll see a picture quite like this. Now, the, the umbra looks like, is, is much easier to see than the penumbra, because the penumbra is, the, again, the, the partial eclipse. But that's the much larger shadow, and then the total eclipse is in the center. That, that's that totally black portion of it. And this is what it would look like if you were in, say, the space station looking down on the Earth. Another cartoon here, again, partial eclipse on the left, total eclipse on the right. Now sometimes the, you know, I should say sometimes, the moon changes in its orbit. It's not a perfect uh, circle, certainly not a perfect circle or ellipse. It's, it's an elliptical orbit. So sometimes it's closer to the Earth, sometimes it's farther away from the Earth. When it's farther away from the Earth, the apparent size is going to be smaller, right? And sometimes you get what's in the middle called an annular eclipse. So it's, it's, it's smaller, it's further away from the Earth, so more of the sunlight can leak around run on the outside, and it's just not totally obscure, and that's what's known as an annular eclipse. That's what we had a few months ago on the other side of the country, if you, uh, if you were uh, listening to the news reports on that. And then here's some photographs of that. Okay, so on the bottom right-hand side, that's a photograph of a partial eclipse. Upper right-hand side, that's a total eclipse. Just before that, that small sliver of the sun is blotted out. And then an annual eclipse in the upper left-hand portion of this. And then the bottom left-hand portion is a time, time, time lap photography of, the, uh, of an, a total eclipse taking place starting from the left to the right. All right. Now let's get into a little bit of the physics of the sun. Uh, you know, the sun gets its, its power from what? Nuclear fusion, right? It fuses hydrogen atoms into heavier helium atoms. The same type of physics that goes on in an H-bomb, except this one is controlled fusion. You know, the, the, the power of, of the reaction is pushing out. The gravitational attraction is pulling in. So it's, it's, it's stable from a gravitational point of view. Uh, or sometimes called uh, gra uh, confinement, gravitational confinement. Now that means that the temperatures are very, very high in the center of the core of the, of the sun in order to get fusion reactions. Uh, tens of millions of degrees, tens of millions of degrees. And of course, as you work your way out, it cools down until eventually you get to the outer portions of the sun. The surface of the sun is now mere, merely tens of thousands of degrees. And then as you move off the surface of the earth, earth off the surface of the sun, and get into the atmosphere, you see in the bottom center of, the, of this image, they, they have something labeled the corona. That's the atmosphere of the sun. 
And, and amazingly, the temperature goes back up again. It goes up into the, from tens of thousands to millions of degrees in the corona. And scientists have a fairly good idea of what's going on, but not a total understanding of what the physics of that. It's, you know, it's, it's possibly that the, the plasma, the charged particles, the fourth state of matter that exists there, are streaming up and down those magnetic field lines that, that, that retain them to accelerate and increase the temperature. So it's, usually, it's the corona that they are most interested in and is the most likely to be studied for uh, during an eclipse, the, the atmosphere of the sun. Okay, this is where <clears throat> we go off on a tangent for just a, just a moment here. Uh, we get asked, you know, what about the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio? Do you do any work on eclipses? And the answer is no. Uh, we, each NASA center specializes in a particular field of study. This is not ours. Uh, you have to go to NASA Goddard in Greenbelt, Maryland, and to a lesser extent, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, to get the people who study uh, heliophysics, the study of the sun, and of course all the universities that work with them. Uh, so this is not our field, with one exception. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I, you got to put something in here for Ohio, right? Uh, for 35 years, we were in charge of launching the intermediate and large uh, launch vehicles for the agency, and that's where I got my start. I spent my first 12 years doing trajectory calculations and performance optimization for uh, those missions. Of course, our launch pads are down at the Cape, but we work with our contractors doing development and integration and fabrication uh, in other parts of the country as well as in Cleveland, Ohio. So for 35 years, we, we did that until the, the program was moved out of Cleveland. Uh, but before that happened, we, we launched a few heliophysics experiments. Uh, one was, oh, actually it was a two spacecraft series helios on Titan 3E, the upper right-hand corner there. That, had a, that was a Titan III Centaur uh, configuration, and it was there. I'm still getting used to bifocals. I, mean, I hate getting old. Uh, yes, yeah, so this was studying the, you know the different parts of of, of the uh, of the sun, and it was launched in the mid 1970s. Uh, Soho, which was in the bottom right hand corner here, was on an Atlas II AS. This is an Atlas Centaur uh, launch vehicle. Uh, that was done more recently in the 1990s. So again, the way this business is set up, you have the transportation part, the boosters, the launch vehicle, the rocket, that is what you see mostly in these pictures. And then the spacecraft is sitting on top of it. And usually one NASA center or foreign country is in charge of the spacecraft and another one is in charge of the launch vehicle. We were in charge of launching the launch vehicle and integrating it. And then there was also uh, Ulysses, the uh, International Solar Polar. It was a high inclination probe of the sun, went around the north and south poles of the sun. We almost launched that one. Uh, that was the sister of, of the one that I was working I was working Galileo to Jupiter. My colleagues were working on Ulysses, and we were all within four months of launch, and then Columbia, or Challenger happened. And of course, that put us on hold for a while, and eventually our program was, was terminated for reasons that we won't go into here. So we were within four months of launching yet another heliophysics uh, spacecraft, uh, but that was not the case. So this is, this is the, when people ask, well, what is your tie to the eclipse? This is as close as we can get. All right. So here's a question that I was, I thought would be very interesting to find out. You know, are they still useful? Are studying eclipses still useful to to the scientific community? I was expecting the answer to be no. I thought, you know, all the easy stuff has been done. We've had spacecraft in, you know, in orbit or around the sun, around the Earth for literally decades. Uh, if there's any work to be done, it's probably done better on spacecraft. And I asked a couple of professors on this, one in my alma mater at Cornell and another from elsewhere. I said, what, of what value is studying the sun through an eclipse today? Or is it mostly just to motivate students to get into the field of astronomy? And he said, they said you know, absolutely not. And in fact, this one paper I've got referenced up here from uh, Pasikoff is actually a really good paper. It's, it's fairly recent, 19, what do I have here? No, no 2017. And he goes through all the different types of studies, uh, primarily focused on the atmosphere of the, of the sun, the corona, uh, you know, how, it, how the solar wind is formed. Solar wind, which is the, the charged particles that emanate from the sun and interact with the ionosphere and the upper portions of our atmosphere, 
very important among other things for you know studying how radio signals are attenuated, uh, how our climate is affected by the sun, which is a strong driver of it. Uh, you know, disruptions of other types of electromagnetic broadcasts that we have. These are all things where the sun directly interacts with, with our planet, and it's important to under, get a good understanding of this. And they explain that you really can't do this very well from Earth orbiting or even solar orbiting satellites. In fact, in some of these areas, you can't do it at all. So uh, studying the sun through eclipses, ground-based astronomy, is still, to this day, 60-some-odd years into the space program, still very, very important. Um, okay, yeah. Later on, I... Okay. Right, okay. So then we, I have here, I've, I've written down some of the things that perhaps some of the folks here in the, the audience here who are studying physics could explain to me. Uh, you know, the dynamics of how, you know, how the solar corona changes both in time and in space. You know, studying the spectra, you know, the, the fingerprints, the, the characteristics of the molecules and the atoms and the, and the ions uh, that characterize the, the corona, how they interact with each other, how they interact with when they reach the Earth, uh, and some other areas as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole plethora of different types of studies that continue to this day to be best studied on the ground uh, during eclipses. Now, here's another thing, you know, the, the Earth is, you know, what, 70% water surface, right? And much of the remaining surface of the, of the Earth is, you know, deserts, mountains, Antarctica, you know, not places that are conducive to scientists doing studies with their, with their uh, instruments. So when you look at that through that filter and you look at these paths, all these are the, the paths of the eclipses over a period of time from what we have 2001 to 2025. Uh, the bright orange ones are annual eclipses, the yellow ones are total eclipses. You see that most of them fall over water or deserts or mountains. Again, not places that are conducive to study. So when something like this that's happening in April falls over the United States, the eastern portion of the United States. I mean, this is really, this is something big because it affords the opportunity to, for lengthy study. You, you have the opportunity to, to uh, you know, you've got a variety, you know, I, I, this one I'm gonna have to read. Okay. So you have, you know, ample number of, and, and a variety of scientific experiments. We have universities that have their, their experiments uh, that are gonna be in the path or close to the path of totality. Uh, they have uh, chase, uh, chances to validate their instrumentation to see if it's, if it's first of all, is it calibrated right? Is it taking correct data? You know, one set of astronomers can be in one part of the state, and another can be in another part of the state to validate each other's readings. Um, there's also uh, time lapses. In other words, we can get, we can study this as time goes, moves forward or in location at the same time. There's just a variety of different opportunities that you just can't have when you have instruments that you have to put, you know, in Antarctica or uh, in a very inhospitable portion of the, of the, uh, of the world. Uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities for people to uh, enjoy this. I mean, people that are not astronomers because they'll be close to population centers. 32 million people, I think, are estimated to be in the, at or within the general path of the, of the eclipse. Uh, it is a total eclipse. It's not an annual eclipse. It's going to be a convenient time of day. It's in the afternoon. Um, if you have bad weather, I mean, <laughs> Ohio in the springtime, what could go wrong, right? Uh, if you have bad weather in one portion of the country, hopefully you won't have bad weather in the other portion of the country. This is a variety of, of, of reasons why. And in addition to that, if you compare it to what we had just a few years ago in 2017, uh, it's going to, the, the amount of length of time is twice that from what we had back then. Uh, the sky will be darker because the moon will be closer to the earth and not f as far away. Uh, it's going to be during a very active portion of uh, its 11 year cycle, it'll be close to solar max. So you'll see these remarkable streamers uh, effect that you see here in this picture uh, if much for, for a much more longer period of time. A uh, chance of uh, studying other things like coronal mass ejections where you have large quantities of plasma that gets sh shot out from the sun uh, will be greater. Uh, spacecraft and Parker Solar Probe, will, they will still be studying at the same time, so you'll be co able to correlate their readings with the readings that we're getting from the surface of the Earth. Uh, 
There's something called the Super Dual Annual uh, Auroral Radar Network, which I could not find out much more about, that will be studying this as well. And as I said before, there's literally tens of millions of people that will be in and around the general area. They'll be able. To, it's just a remarkable opportunity for us. As if they have to be told, the uh, people running the National Science Foundation sent out a dear colleague letter. Said, you know, don't sleep through this. Put in your proposals. There's federal money for studying this, as there should be. I, I would argue this is this is something that uh, the whole of, of society benefits from for studying and learning about this. So they urged them to put in, you know, proposals for studying, you know, the corona and studying Earth's atmosphere, how it interacts with that as, as well. And, and there are others in these various areas. And it's not just for the professionals. It's not just for the professionals. The amateurs or the younger people there, the, the you know, the astronomy clubs here, they needed, they had opportunities to put in for grants as well. And here's just three of them that I picked at, at, at ra pure random. Uh, here's one, some folks here in Southern Illinois a University. Uh, they needed 70, 70 locations to track the plumes of solar material of the inner corona. Again, this is something that is aimed at amateur astronomy organizations. Uh, here's one that uh, uh, SRI in, in Colorado. They needed 35 teams to, to study the changes in the corona, uh, and they were going to put together a, a one hour long video for all this. And here's yet another one in Southern California, Sonoma State. They needed at least 100 locations, 100 volunteers to, study, to photograph the eclipse and, and to uh, uncover plasma flows and jets in the images. So, and, and there are many, many more of these opportunities out there. Maybe somebody in the audience was put in. Is, is anyone there have a grant to do any of this, by the way? I should have asked this to begin with. No. Okay, and perhaps one of your local astronomy groups knows of something like this. So there was an opportunity uh, to, to use the amateurs' uh, uh, communities to supplement what the professional astronomers are doing in the other universities. Okay, I have several pictures here. How are we doing? Okay, I have several pictures here on the, the ground track. Now, the this one here, it's a little hard to see, but all those hashed out lines represent the portion of the globe of the Earth that will see some part of the eclipse. Now, granted, the vast majority of this, the overwhelming majority of this, is partial eclipse. If you can see the bottom there, just before you get to South America, that's the line for zero occultation. And then the next one up is 20% and 40% and so on until you get to that bright purple band. And that's the band of totality. Those are the lucky ones that get to see a total solar eclipse. And then that continues back up 80, 60, 40, 20, and zero. Uh, folks in Alaska, poor Alaska, they don't get any of the fun, at least this time around. They do later on in another year. But that purple band is the band that sees a total eclipse. And it starts, as you can see, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, go, crosses over Mexico. That, if you can see that, there's a red dot right over the central part of Mexico. Those are the lucky ones that see not only total eclipse, but the, the longest uh, duration of the total eclipse, four, four minutes, what is this, four minutes, 27 seconds, something like that. And that band extends up through Texas, you know, up through the middle part, you know, Ohio, and then, you know, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, up into the Maritime Provinces, uh, about a dozen states uh, here in this country will see a totality. The, the width is, is, is broad. It, the last time around it was like 75 miles. This one's 125 miles. It's a broad, broad band this time. Uh, and Ohio will be one of the greatest durations in, 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 in our area and in your area as well. Uh, we'll see totality for a, a great period of time. Okay, now this one, again, this is more of an eye chart. Everything in that gold band sees totality. So then the question is, well, how long? And again, you, it's hard to tell from here, but the innermost contour of that uh, is about five minutes and 50 seconds, I believe. Uh, you folks get about, about, it's not five minutes, four minutes, what am I saying? I, know, I should know this. Three minutes, okay, it's been shrinking on me. Three minutes, 50 seconds for you folks here in, in Lima. We get three more seconds up in o Northern Ohio. <laughs> uh, as if that means much. 
Uh, but uh, again, then it shrinks as it goes for, forward in time. If you run this backward in time, it was four minutes, that's what I was thinking, four minutes, four minutes, th 24 seconds back down in, uh, at the beginning. All right. And again, it's the, the entire field right there. Now, what about the ob observatories? Uh, and, and you can see, by the way, if you look carefully, I think that's right, yes. Okay, so Lima, you guys are almost right on the center line like we are. You can make that out from the map. You had an, uh, 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 a telescope in Tiffin, unfortunately. That got moved. The last I read about that was it was undergoing some renovation is going to be sent to Brooklyn, New York, unfortunately. Because that was the only major observatory that was almost right on the center line. But there are others. We have a few in, in Cleveland. You've got some in, in Toledo as well. Um, again, most of these are in the path of totality. So they all are, are going to see something. All right, this is what I should have leaned in on. And this is, these, just, these are just the, the Cleveland numbers. Yours will be a little bit earlier. Ours is about at 3.15 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm in a community called Avon Lake. We sit right on the lake. And I'm told that our hotels have been booked for months. Uh, the local governments are telling people, and you probably may have heard similar things, that they're advising people <laughs> not to have any doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, don't do anything like try to clean the roof that day and you end up needing to call an ambulance, heaven forbid. They're expecting a lot of traffic jams. Um, we'll find out how, well, whether that's overblown or not, but uh, better safe than sorry. Just, uh, and then here's the, here's the other thing. Uh, I get this asked a lot, you probably do as well, you know, where do I have to go? You don't have to go anywhere, especially here in where you are, according to the ground tracks, you just have to walk out your front door and look up. It's, it's, it's that convenient. Now, for the bad news. Now, I don't have it for your community, I just have it for Cleveland, but, uh, you know, we are talking about April, we are talking about weather in Ohio, and especially Cleveland. Uh, we have a, this is a, you know, months on the x-axis and probability of precipitation on, and cloud cover on the y-axis. So you have March, April, May. We have a 45% chance of a, having a clear day, which means, of course, we have a 55% chance of having overcast. You've got to accept the good with the bad. And if, if you look at just the actual chance of precipitation, we have a 30% chance of, of rain, at least in Cleveland, on that day. Um, one person in a prior audience was, I think he really wanted to rub it in. He says, yes, it's not just rain. You have a, you have a 5% chance of actually having mixed snow rain precipitation. Thing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, but, you know, you know, the other thing, you, you can look at it from an optimistic point of view. You know, I, I would recommend perhaps praying the night before and say, look, God, you know, all we need is, is, is four minutes. <laughs> we don't even need the whole sky to be clear, just this one little region. You know, can't you help us out a little bit? Uh, but, you know, even if, even if there is overcast, you know, there are, there are things that you can do. Okay? And this is mostly aimed at the high school teachers, if we have any in the audience. You know, let's say you've got overcast. Uh, you know, you can turn it into a science experiment. You can have them start taking temperature readings, because it will get dark, the temperature will start falling. The pressure will be changing. Ambient light, of course, will be changing. It's not going to be pitch black, but it will get dark. Uh, you, can, uh, you can make uh, audio recordings of, of the wild animals if you live in a forested area. You know, the nocturnal animals, you know, they're going to think, hey, it's, 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 it's early, but it's, it's dark, you know, time to, to get active. Uh, create a, a video of the illumination changes. Uh, watch it on live stream. Uh, if you really want to get artistic and creative about it, play some appropriate music at a social event that you have for your students. You know, Ain't No Sunshine by Bill Withers. How about Black Hole Sun from Soundgarden or, or Eclipse from Pink Floyd? My favorite would be Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart. So it'd be creative. The, the only thing I would I'd recommend not playing is uh, Manfred Mann's Earth Band, uh, you know, Blinded by the Light. I think that sends the, the wrong message. Please stay away from that. Okay, now the, the mandatory, the obligatory safety tips here. Uh, I'm sure that all of you in the audience understand this. But for those of you who have children or grandchildren, you need to police the kids. You know, you cannot look at this. 
I don't care how dark it gets without glasses on. Technically, technically, if you're in complete totality, you can use it without glasses. I would not recommend it because it's too close. The eyesight is very important, obviously. Uh, I would put the glasses on. I'd keep them on if I were you. Uh, make sure that they are legitimate glasses. They're not uh, knockoffs. Make sure they're not damaged. You know, you don't want a, a, a tiny, you know, scrape in, the, in it, uh, any scratches on it. You know, observe them before you put them on, especially before you put them on your kids. Uh, put them on first and then look at the eclipse, and then when you're done looking at it, look away from the eclipse and take them off. Do it in that order. Uh, people have asked me about welders, arcs, and x-ray paper. You can use those if you know what you're doing. Most people do not. I certainly would not. I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't risk it. I would, I would go to your local science center and perhaps a local museum. NASA has a limited amount of glasses that they're handing out, uh, but get them from reputable sources, sources that you trust. Um, if you're like me and I'm super paranoid about this sort of thing, you know, what you're looking at is, is 93 million miles away. You don't need binocular vision to, it, to see it. Put the glasses on and put one hand over one eye. You just need one eye to look at the eclipse. Like I said, it's, it's, it's far away. Um, and, and enjoy, and enjoy. Oh, I forgot. There was one that I should have emphasized here. It's the obvious thing. I've done this before. Where is this? Okay, on the bottom of this one here, <clears throat> perhaps you saw it and I, I should have pointed this out. Uh, somewhere on the Earth, we have a total eclipse once every year and a half, but there's only been 21 total solar eclipses that have been in the lower 48 since the beginning of this country. That's a pretty remarkable statistic, 21 in the history of this country. It gets even better. The last total eclipse that was visible in Ohio was in the year 1806. And the next one will be in the year 2099. That's 75 years from now. I don't know about you, but I have no intention of sticking around. So, uh, you know, don't snooze through this one. You know, it's, it's, it's something to be put on your calendar and not to be missed. Okay. There's all sorts of websites for this. You've probably seen them. You know, we, we at NASA, we have one. State, Ohio State University has one. Uh, Ohio State has, uh, the state of Ohio has one. Great Lakes Science Center where I'm at. And, and there, are, there are others. There's lots out there. Um, oh, sorry, I got the wrong. We have local astronomy organizations. We have some affiliated with our science center and the local regions. You should probably have your own here. Uh, uh, in, in Lima, uh, I, I would work with them. They they love to have people, you know, use their equipment. You know, granted, it is an eclipse; it's happening very quickly, so they'll probably only let you, you know, look through their their, their telescopes for a few seconds. But uh, they usually know what they're doing. They have good filters for their equipment. Uh, you know, I I would work with them. Okay, let's skip over this. Get to this. You know, again. To summarize, eclipses have been an important part of scientific discovery and they remain so to this day in spite of us being in the space age. There's things that only can be done from the surface of the earth or at best be done by the sur at the surface of the earth. Like I said, it's going to be a long time since the next one is here. Uh, it will be an exciting event as long as we have sun. Remember, no sun, no fun, or, or not very much fun. But and remember, always use reputable produced sunglasses for the eclipse uh, and, and police your kids and your grandkids. Make sure they don't do something foolish. Uh, let's leave it at that and I'll take some questions from the audience. Yes, now this is this is the selected websites, yeah. Now some of these are, you know, regionally focused, others, you know, anyone can use them. So I, I, would, I would recommend these. A lot, of the, a lot of the material that I, most of the material that I'm used here were taken from these sites and, and others. Yes. In what way? The, what, what little I remember from my, my, high, my college or relativity, a lot of that has been studied and proven over, but 
A lot of times they redo these experiments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most, most likely universities that have graduate programs in this you know, would be interested in that. Maybe not so much NASA per se, because we tend to build spacecraft and launch to study things. Uh, but if you find you know, a, a university that has a good, solid astronomy department, uh, they, they would be able to guide you on that. Other, other questions? I could not have done that good a job. I know I kind of went through this kind of quick. Mm -hmm. You'll notice it. I mean, I, I don't know what, what, what it was like here, but I was actually further east. I was in New York in 2017, and uh, you know that was not a, a total eclipse. It was, it, was an, it was an annual eclipse, and where I was, it was only a partial eclipse. And at the end of the whatever it was, five minutes, you, I could tell the temperature had fallen because it was, it was a, a warm day that day. And after, you know, three, four minutes, the temperature was coming down. Now, it wasn't cold, but it was noticeable. And you'll get the same thing here. No tough questions from the technical folks, huh? Yes, somebody in the back, yes. Well first, well, first of all, it's like looking at the sun. Most of it is blocked, point number one. Point number two, people can't judge when it starts peaking out. You know, that, that shuttle travels at roughly 1,000 or somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 miles an hour. And if you're, if you're late and, you, and your eyes get sort of starting to get acclimated to the brightness and you just say, oh, I'm going to hang on to just another second, another second, you could do some real damage to, your, to the retina of your eye if you do that. That's why they say, you know, put the glasses on and keep them on. I, I wouldn't risk it. You know, it's, not, it's not worth it. Nobody else? Okay, you've been, okay, yes, in the back. It does? Oh, okay. Do, do you know what type and what size? Do you know what type and what size? Um, oh, okay. The reason why I ask is not that I'm an expert on, on telescopes, but the source that I had, they cut it off at, you know, fairly large size. And that's probably why it escaped the, uh, the database. Okay, I'll look into that. Or I will stick around to take other questions. If you, uh, if anyone would like to ask me in private, you've been a great audience, and thank you for the opportunity. And enjoy it on, in April eighth. All right. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for spending the evening with us and sharing your wealth of knowledge about what we can expect and maybe why we should pay attention when totality comes to our neighborhood. Thank you all for attending tonight. The final lecture in this series will be 7 p.m. Thursday, March 21st, and will be in the Science Building in Room 100 with our National Weather Service meteorologist, Dustin Norman, who will talk about an eclipse and how it changes the world around us, however briefly, including the weather. He will also dive into one of the Midwesterners' favorite topics, which is unusual weather phenomena that happen, and all of which seem to have experienced in the last week. <laughs> I also have an exciting Eclipse programming announcement. We have added an Eclipse-themed art show that kicks off with an opening reception from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Farmer Fallery Gallery on the same day as the last speaker in this series. The exhibition is 400 times smaller 400 times nearer, and it speaks to the multiple and shifting perspectives, both scientific and cultural, of this beautiful illusionary dance of heavenly bodies and the importance of the audience's personal locality in the here and now. I hope you can come a bit early and spend some time enjoying the art show and opening reception. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Information can be found on the flyers in the lobby uh, that we have available this evening. Please join us for some cookies and conversations.
Thank you.